A very good morning and welcome to the third joint meeting in 2022 of members of the Criminal Justice, the Health, Social Care and Sport and the Social Justice and Social Security Committees to consider the progress being made in implementing the recommendations of the Scottish Drug Deaths Task Force. Um, with no apologies this morning, and I welcome Alex Cole Hamilton to the meeting, and Faisal Chowdhury should hopefully be joining us online shortly. So our first item is to decide whether to take item three in private, which is consideration of our forward work programme. Are we all agreed? Yeah, thank you very much. So our next agenda item is our third oral evidence session on reducing drug deaths in Scotland and tackling problem drug use. And I refer members to papers one, two and three. And I welcome to the meeting this morning Angela Constance, Minister for Drugs Policy, Orlando Heimer Masson, Deputy Director for Drugs <laughs> Policy, and Ros Curry, team leader with the Drug Death Task Force response in the Scottish Government. So thank you very much indeed, Minister uh, and colleagues, uh, for uh, joining us, and also, uh, Minister, for foregoing your opportunity to make some opening remarks. So we'll just move straight into um, questions, and um, I will jump straight in, if I may. So, um, first of all, thank you for keeping the committees informed uh, of the development of the National Mission Plan and the Oversight Group, uh, and also obviously keeping the Parliament updated on uh, a range of developments relating to drugs deaths, MAT standards, uh, substance misuse and the justice system, and other areas of ongoing work. So, if I... Um, if I may, I'd like to open up um, this morning's session with, just with a couple of questions around ADPs. So in the Changing Lives report, um, the, the report sets out some of the challenges experienced by specific populations, um, including uh, women and young people. And I was actually, I didn't realise, I was quite disturbed to understand the sort of correlation between deaths of women with substance use problems and the peri in the perinatal period and child protection proceedings um, or having children taken into care. And in respect of young people, um, drug-related deaths among people uh, under 25 have risen sharply in recent years. So... Related to that um, particular uh, issue, Action 30 outlines how ADPs and services must ensure specific pathways are developed to ensure young people uh, can access the support that they need uh, when they need it. Um, so, as a former member of the Aberdeen City ADP, I'm interested to hear any update that you can provide uh, on these two actions, the Action 29 uh, relating to Pathways for Women uh, and Action 30 relating to young people, um, and specifically the progress that's being made um, by ADPs in developing local pathways uh, to services and support, given that their crucial role in ultimately reducing uh, drug harm and drug death numbers. Thank you very much, Convener. And uh, good morning to all your colleagues. Um, I very much appreciate the opportunity uh, to come back to this uh, tripartite uh, committee session and as we embark on the, the national mission and particularly in our work to respond to the vital final recommendations of the task force, uh, which is essentially about assuring that uh, all aspects of the public sector and all parts of government are aligned. It seems fitting to me, although it's not for me, uh, to tell committee committees how to uh, proceed uh, with their scrutiny of government, it does appear a very um, fitting um, approach indeed for scrutiny also to be um, joined up. Um, convener, you raise two crucially important um, aspects uh, in terms of our drug death challenge. Um, when we look at the annual report that was published this summer, um, we know that while more men die, um, by a, significantly so, um, that there is a disproportionate increase in the number of women uh, that are dying, and that has been a trend for some years. Uh, the annual report, you know, will show a small decrease um, in the number of men who, who are dying, 
um, but it shows um, an increase, a continued increase in the number of women that we're losing. And we know, we know that that um, is uh, complex, um, but it is in relation to trauma. Um, and past life trauma, but it is also in relation to uh, women who are mothers. And if we think people who use drugs are stigmatised, uh, that, uh, in my view, is even greater for women, and particularly uh, women who are, are mothers. So we know that the removal of children uh, has um, a huge uh, traumatic impact and is a contributory factor. Um, to, to deaths. So obviously in the same way that we are working through task force recommendations, uh, we will be supporting alcohol and drug partnerships uh, to do likewise and indeed to uh, develop pathways. Um, you may have noticed that earlier this week that we published the first um, annual report on both the national mission and also the, the alcohol and drug path, um, alcohol and drug partnerships. Um, and yes, we do need to make more progress um, with very specific uh, care pathways um, for. For, for women and obviously some of our investment in terms of residential rehabilitation uh, and residential services um, has been prioritised to, to meet that need. We are also in terms of young people, so the annual report uh, that was published this summer shows that while for 2021 uh, the number of young people under 25 who had died at that figure had reduced, uh, but it still remains too high, it is always important not to look at one year's figures in isolation, uh, because we do know that the three years preceding that uh, was shown concerning increases. Um, and I think alcohol and drug partnerships um, themselves, and you'll see in the annual report that they, while they all have uh, services and supports available for young people, I think uh, and I know there is much more we need to do in terms of being clear about the, the types and range of services uh, that should be available um, in, in each area. And that, in part, is um, why we have a, a stream of work um, uh, specifically on young people. It is about the, the co-design um, of standards um, of care and treatment and the range of, of services. And that work um, is proceeding, and I'll endeavour to keep committee and parliament up, up, up to date on that. Thanks very much, Minister. And I think following on from that, I, I won't ask questions just now on it, but obviously as the... Um, it is lived experience and living experience and how important that will be to inform those specific areas of, of work. So I, I think other members will, will, will touch on that later. So I'll just open up um, questions uh, to members. And I'm firstly going to bring in Alex Cole-Hamilton and then I'll bring in Katie Clark. Alex. Well, thank you very much, Convener, and I appreciate um, the offer of allowing me to come and sit with you today. Um, and thank you very much, Minister. Um, I, first of all, I have a couple of questions on ADPs and MAT standards, but actually I'd like to come immediately in on uh, deaths in young people. And this is actually quite topical, um, given there was a death in my constituency a couple of weeks ago at a festival or as a result of um, uh, taking drugs at a festival. Um, I have had meetings with the festival organisers who I've met with beforehand who are exemplars in in terms of providing a safe space, in terms of they have a state of the art medical facility on site, they have security, they have healthcare staff. Um, this young lady very sadly uh, died having ingested substances before she attended, so there was nothing, there's zero, zero tolerance um, approach. Um, could have done to protect her. However, there, there is a perverse reality in the way that we are policing our festivals in Scotland at the moment, as opposed to England. Um, we have a zero tolerance approach to um, drug use at festivals. And, and on paper, I understand that that sounds compelling. Um, but in England, we have pill testing um, and a, a recognition that um, that some people will just get high at festivals and we, we want them to be able to do so in, a, um, in safety. And, and what I'd like to ask is whether you've had to, you consider discussions with the Lord Advocate around the policing of um, these events so that we can allow young people, or any people of any age, to attend these festivals um, in, as safely as possible in the recognition that you're just not going to stop um, people choosing to to take substances on occasion and, and we need to allow them to do so in safety as they do in England and Wales. So, um, firstly, um, my 
condolences um, to the family of Mr Cole Hamilton's constituent. I mean, I think any deaths are tragedy. Um, and we all feel that. And I think that the death of young people um, is always particularly sore. Um, this points to the need for drug checking facilities. Um, I have um, discussed this matter fairly extensively with UK government and um, the, the various um, ministers for uh, UK crime and policing. Um, I think Mr Cohamlet would have a slightly different understanding um, of what the position is in England, um, because in my engagement with uh, UK ministers is that they are really resistant to drug checking facilities at festivals. Um, I am aware of one licence um, uh, in recent times um, being uh, made available to, uh, on a short term basis to support um, festivals, but I think it is fair to say that across the UK uh, we do not have enough drug checking facilities at these types of events. Now, drug checking facilities require a home office licence, um, and there is obviously the postal service. Um, that operates in Wales and has operated in Wales uh, for, for a number of years where people can get substances um, tested. But the important thing about drug checking facilities is how they are layered with um, other harm reduction methods. So I'm very in favour um, of extending uh, drug checking facilities. I don't think we're doing enough of that across the UK. It does uh, require um, a home office licence. Um, and we have three, uh, there's work going on in Scotland in terms of three um, projects. So there's research that's been on at the same time that projects have been um, developed. Um, and one of those projects is uh, needing a position where they'll be able to make an application uh, to, to the home office, but they're kind of geographically uh, specific. Um, the point about um, you know, the, 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 the Lord Advocate, we will of course engage with all colleagues um, on that um, if there are different approaches uh, that are required uh, based on experience and based on tragedy. Thank you. I'm grateful. Um, if I can move on to Matt standards. Um, Despite recent implementation and, and some success of the implementation of uh, MAT standards, um, it's still proving difficult to access same-day services in areas of rural rurality, um, and where clinics are few and far between. <coughs> um, can I ask what your plans are to increase provision of same-day services in those rural and harder-to-reach areas? It's a fair point, Mr Cole-Hamilton. Um, I'm not going to uh, sugarcoat where progress hasn't been good enough or um, fast enough. Um, you are, are right to allude to that while the majority of the, the red, amber, green status in the benchmarking report by Public Health Scotland was in amber, there uh, wasn't enough greens and there was too many reds, uh, particularly in and around MAT Standard 1, which is that crucial life-saving uh, same-day treatment. Um, and that's why, for the very first time, uh, we have a, a ministerial direction um, that places certain requirements on uh, chief officers and chief executives of health boards, IGBs and uh, local, local authorities. We are, I am due to update Parliament very imminently, maybe in the next fortnight or so, certainly next month, um, on the, the progress uh, since uh, my last update to Parliament, um, and that is based on the improvement plans that we have received from every area. And obviously, for some areas, they are now in a cycle of quarterly reporting. Um, other areas uh, where the challenge is greater, uh, they are subject to, 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 to monthly reporting. But we are uh, beginning to see some good and innovative practice um, in and around uh, rural areas, um, and I think we will we'll, uh, share. Some, you know, perhaps we should share some case studies um, with the committee on that. Um, and if I can point to borders, so borders is a rural, rural area, um, who were the one area that were able to secure green um, across MAT standards one to five. So if we can do it in borders, uh, we can do it elsewhere. That's not underestimating the challenge, uh, but this, this can be done and it should be done. Final question, Camina? If I can come back yeah, to no, you, no, that's uh, fine. please. Absolutely. There's quite a lot of questions yeah, no, no, no. and members to, 
to, to come in. Uh, okay, thanks. I'll just um, bring in Katie Clark and then we'll move on to some questions around statistics and I'll bring in Natalie. Katie. Thank you very much, um, convener. Minister, as you are very well aware, um, the drugs deaths in Scotland are significantly higher than other parts of Europe. From the work that you've been involved with so far and all the work that's been carried out, have you been able to come to any conclusions as to why that is and what evidence there is to show why we fare so badly? So, um, I always um, distill this into three uh, very important factors. It is, of course, uh, complex. We have some um, deep-rooted uh, challenges in Scotland. Um, the task force um, and various other academics have written extensively about the um, uh, acute poverty in particular areas uh, of the country. We all know um, the research in and around the relationship between substance use and past trauma and poverty. And, but in terms of your specific point about why Scotland? Um, so, uh, factor number one is that um, in terms of the, the information that we're able to gather on prevalence, there is a higher prevalence of problematic drug use um, in Scotland. Um, now, there's quite an existential question as to why that is. Um, the Second point is the prevalence of heroin and benzodiazepines in drug-related deaths. It's not always able to do direct comparisons because the drug misuse deaths and, and um, England are a bit different in terms of the, the underlying work and in terms of the proportion of cases that go through toxicology and forensic screening. Um, but what we do know is there is a much greater implication of benzodiazepines in, in our deaths, um, significantly more um, than England and Wales. Um, although um, I noticed some reporting and recording that is beginning to indicate a, a rising benzodiazepine problem um, south, south of the border. Um, and there is a higher implication of opioids and, and heroin in, in our um, drug deaths, which speaks to um, higher risk behaviours, more injecting, um, and you know those lethal combinations and poly drug misuse, and of course people with very multiple um, complex needs. And, and the third reason is about treatment, and I have been utterly frank about this time and time again. Um, we do not have enough of our people in the protection of treatment. Um, and that means we need to get more people into treatment. And then when they are in treatment, if people fall out of treatment, uh, we need to uh, follow up. And that speaks to the importance um, of MAT standards. It speaks to the importance of not just investing in services, um, but also um, re reform in services. There are you know, other aspects that I have opinions on in terms of Misuse of Drugs Act, etc. But in terms of treatment, um, you know, we need to, and we are, core part of the national mission is investing and reforming our treatment services, but crucially not in isolation from that other cross-government work that's so important. The task force contains 20 recommendations and 139 actions. Could you put on record whether you accept all of those recommendations and those actions, and whether the Scottish Government is going to pursue them all? I well, um, appreciate that 20 recommendations and 139 actions and of course the task force was an iterative process. There were other recommendations that came out um, earlier um, and that I hope uh, I have demonstrated through the information I gave to committee that you know, progress is already uh, underway. We didn't sit back and just wait on the final uh, recommendation of the task force. But I gave a very um, warm welcome to both the challenge uh, and, to be frank, the criticism that the, the final report um, contained uh, for, for the government. Um, as you will appreciate with all those actions, we've got a lot to work through, um, but I will be endeavouring uh, to give a very positive response when, at the turn of the year, we come back with the uh, cross-government action plan and the, the stigma action plan, that when we come back um, to Parliament with that, um, that um, 
will be able to demonstrate an overwhelmingly positive response. Will we implement every recommendation in the precise way? Um, you will appreciate that it's the, the role of organisations um, and people who are making recommendations to make recommendations. Government then have to um, quite often work out the how. You will indeed. OK, thank you. OK, thank you. And I'll bring in Natalie Dawn, and then after Natalie, I'll bring in Paul O'Kane. Natalie. Thank you, Convener, and equally thank you for letting me join this morning, and good morning to the Minister. So, looking at the statistics, 93% of all the drug deaths, there was more than one drug present. And I know in the report there's little reference to alcohol, so I'm wondering if we know how regularly this was present with another substance. And from my own experience, both in personal life and dealing with constituents, alcohol is often something that leads on to other things. In terms of preventative and early intervention measures, can the Minister advise what research has been done on the part that alcohol plays in drug misuse, or equally these statistics that we've got in front of us? So, so the Member is probably aware that there are um, separate statistics produced in and around alcohol-related deaths that relate to um, deaths by alcohol-related uh, illnesses or illnesses or health conditions that can be traced to, um, you know, problematic use of, of alcohol. The um, and, I, and I also should say, say convener, I, uh, just for the record, I know that we're now getting into talking about statistics, but um, we, we are also talking about lost lives and, 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 and people. So. Um, you know, I'll try and do that as sensitively as, as, as I can, as opposed to getting into you know too much of a dispassionate discussion about statistics. But the, our annual um, drug-related deaths are in relation to um, illicit substances and controlled drugs. So that's you know the, the, the purpose of those statistics. You know, how many deaths are as a result of um, the use of controlled drugs and um, illicit? Um, substances. Um, we do, you're right to point to the 93% um, of the people we lose have more than one substance um, in their system. And um, in, in those um, deaths, it is 11 to 12%. So 11 to 12% um, of those who lose will also have alcohol in, in their system. And that has actually um, went down from previous years, where you would have, it would have been maybe around, uh, in some years, up to about 30%. Now, I, but I think that speaks to the growing problem with other substances, as opposed to, you know, necessarily a, a reducing problem with alcohol. And the other thing we need to distinguish between, so while the, uh, there's a, an aspect of the national mission is, is absolutely focused on those who are at risk of dying um, and therefore you know we're focused on you know treatment options and developing treatment options further in and around you know opiates benzodiazepines and cocaine i think when you speak to um, organizations for example scottish families affected by drugs and alcohol they will tell you in terms of their families and the people they're supporting the number one concern remains alcohol um, and uh, if you look at some of the work done by David Nutt, um, he published some work in The Lancet that details um, harms caused to individuals and society and to others with various substances. Alcohol is at the top, the top of the list. Thank you, Minister. Um, just moving on slightly. Drug misuse deaths have increased, and in, you mentioned, uh, Minister mentioned this, sorry, in recent years in all age groups except those under 25, although, as the Minister stated earlier, this is still too high for that group. But does that offer any hope that preventative or early intervention measures are working or are starting to work? Do we have any data on drug use among this 15 to 24 age group in terms of the drugs that are being used in comparison to other age groups? And does the Minister feel there's enough work being done to distinguish between the different age groups the kinds of drugs that are being used and equally the frequency of those drugs, which is vital for education and those early intervention uh, measures that we've been speaking about? So, yes. So, um, that there is, um, through um, some of the surveys that are done in education, um, uh, there 
So, so what we know about young people that is different from other age groups, and I refuse to use the term older, um, what we know about young people is that they are less inclined um, to be um, using heroin, um, and that um, cannabis and cocaine is a bigger factor in the drug use patterns of, 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 of young people. Um, and the point about your question uh, earlier that I did not um, address is, therefore, you know, what are we doing in and around education and prevention? Um, and this, this is um, why we have a national mission. So we can't have a uh, drugs policy or indeed our work to deal with the here and now and uh, prevent people from dying in isolation from that, that, that longer term and very, very necessary work. I, I'm not going to overread the um, reduction in the number of young people dying in one year's statistics, because actually I think it's always important that we get underneath Neath the, the, the headlines. But the work in schools, for example, is, is, is crucial. There is, of course, work going on with um, young people that is about um, substances overall. Um, and I don't think we need to over fragment that. You know, so we do, of course, need to be engaging and are um, with young people within the curriculum around you know, tobacco, alcohol, illicit substances. We published some research because um, one of the, the asks in the cross-government plan is really to um, review what we're doing and to, I think there are strong arguments on the need to, to, to up data. So interventions, and we did publish some research on this last year, is that interventions have to be about increasing the resilience of young people um, and increasing their confidence um, and their knowledge. And while, yes, you want you know, young people to have particular information to, so that they are equipped to reduce the harm um, that is associated with different um, substances, I think there is a broad approach that is um, upskilling young people and the resilience, and there is a whole, I think, larger agenda out with education about diversion from our criminal justice system. And I'm very um, interested uh, in how um, some areas are looking to adapt, not do a shift and lift, but how some areas are looking to adapt um, the Icelandic model or aspects of the Icelandic model. Um, and that's much more about, you know, not just um, treatment um, and diversion from the criminal justice system, actually it's about investment in young people and the resources and their pastimes um, and their uh, broader health and wellbeing, um, as well as having you know, other purposeful activities. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. Okay, thank you very much. I'll bring in Paul O'Kane and then I'll move on to Gillian Martin. Paul. Thank you uh, very much, uh, convener. Um, I wonder if uh, I can ask about um, the figures in terms of drugs death. Obviously, uh, the figures we have focus on overdose, and much of our approach has been focused around that. But you know, I think it's clear that uh, there are other issues which can lead to death that are related to drugs, not least issues like um, HIV, EPC, issues around cardiovascular problems, uh, end of, end of life, uh, liver and lung disease. Um, so I wonder to what extent, um, my understanding is we don't capture that data in terms of those deaths. So, so it, what would your kind of reflections be, Minister, on, on how we might be able to do some of that uh, to ensure that we, we can push resources to the right place? I think it's a fair point. Um, and it is important to remember that our focus on the national mission and drug death sits um, in the context of uh, wider efforts to improve the population health um, as, as, as a whole. Um, and uh, my understanding is that there, there are um, you know, there are some, inf some information and there is some data collected in and around um, specific um, deaths, you know, whether it's um, HIV. Um, there are obviously, there's information that's published in and around um, wound care, bloodborne viruses. But I think, you know, I'll go back and look to see whether enough of that, and it's a conversation um, I'll have with Miss Todd, whether enough of that is... You know, kind of routinely published. Um, you know, where does it sit in terms of management information, experimental uh, information? Uh, you know, or whether there's an appropriate regular um, cycle of that. But I think 
that terrain very much sits in the context of improving um, the population health um, overall. And I'll come back to the member on that. Um, Thank you, Convener. Um, that's been very helpful. I, th I think I was keen that the Minister was able to go away and review that because I'm not trying to, try to catch the Minister or add to, to, to what is a very important piece of work, but I just think it is important that we capture those other aspects so we can ensure that all of our resources are focused. And I think particularly in terms of the resources that are available to communities in that space, where um, they, they do work on the broader uh, issues that are associated. Also issues like accidents related to drugs, and, and personal safety. Um, so, so, so I don't know if the Minister wanted to add anything in that space, Convener. So I, I think I would um, agree that it is important that we have um, uh, a wide and appropriate dashboard of information uh, where we can understand all of the harms as well as you know, the, the contributing factors to drug-related deaths, but it is important that we have uh, that information about all um, of, of the, ha the harms. What I hope that um, I've managed to demonstrate, at least to some extent, with the publication of our National Mission Plan um, in August, uh, sorry, September, and in the publication of both the National Mission Annual Report and the ADP um, Annual Report, is that we do very much have an outcomes framework. Um, you will see in the National Mission Plan and in our National Mission Annual Report the information that we are currently using that feeds in so that we can capture um, harms. But I think if committee you know, came to the view that we weren't capturing all of that, we would certainly end endeavour um, to, to, to address that. Thank you, Convener. Thank you. Um, we'll now move on to some questions around lived experience. And I'll bring in Julian Martin and then Miles Briggs. Thank you very much, uh, Convener. And uh, I'd like to ask the Minister, I've asked the Minister quite a few times on this particular subject about those who um, need to access treatment but who have caring responsibilities, um, particularly um, mums and dads. Um, and the Framework for Families um, published last year obviously ha had a lot in there about that. I'd like to uh, ask what progress there's been. I know that this week there was some significant uh, announcements ar ar around that in terms of facilities, but uh, progress around helping those access treatment of whatever type when they have care and responsibilities. Okay, so <clears throat> I'll, give you an ex I'll give you one example. Um, I spoke to um, a woman yesterday at a recovery orientated systems of care event for, for women, uh, 200 women in Glasgow um, with you know, lived and living experience, all uh, putting, putting the world to rights uh, and certainly holding uh, my feet to the fire. Uh, fabulous um, event and it was a, a Glasgow ADP uh, lived and living experience uh, reference group. And they're also going to be one of the reference groups for the uh, National Collaborative. But I met a woman who, who told me that um, when she um, was embarking upon in the earlier stages of her own recovery journey, that um, social work were involved um, with her and her, her children, and they were of the view that she, you know, couldn't take her child to a fellowship meeting, to a recovery meeting. Um, which, in, in my view, you know, there may be—I'm not making judgments about cases—but um, um, it did beg the question about whether we understand enough about you know the recovery community and recovery uh, opportunities and and that you know meant that this lady therefore was very constrained in the time that she could you know spend you know going to meetings and invest in herself and her own her own um, recovery so there there are quite sometimes quite simple things that can be done in, in practice um, that it really speaks to that more personal personalised care approach and acknowledging that the challenges that parents with caring responsibilities have. Um, of course, there's the really um, uh, 
great day on, on Monday with the um, official opening of Harper House and Saltcoats. Um, it's been open a few weeks now and has began to, to take the first families coming in. Um, it opened for referrals um, last month and we're now beginning to see you know, more referrals and, um, and you know, some families um, enter those uh, great facilities. Uh, and it is a, a national specialist uh, facility um, that is available you know, for families all over um, Scotland, um, and um, it you know will be a leading therapeutic uh, facility, and there will be services in areas across the country that will be able to learn from it as well. There's other work we're doing in terms of working with Aberlour, um, in terms of child and mother houses, the, our, our work with the uh, River Garden and Auchan Crew and uh, they are increasing their uh, facilities uh, for, 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 for women um, as well. But in terms of the um, whole family approach, um, the, the, the families framework, um, there again is, is a stream of work that is led by multidisciplinary experts in this area. Um, and they, of course, are working to support and share best practice, but they will also be doing an audit of how that framework has been implemented. And again, this is about gathering and publishing more information so that we can really you know, support, but also scrutinise uh, what's happening on the ground. Yeah. Thank you. you you've preempted my second question about actually auditing what's happened before. Um, all of us will have heard situations where you've maybe had a mother who's had a child taken away from her and, 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 and then falls pregnant again, and there's an expectation that that's going to happen. Is, is there going to be drilling down into that kind of situation to see where that support could have been in place? Um, to, to, to help somebody when they find themselves in a situation where they, they, they are pregnant again and they're worried about their child being taken off them and to support them to actually have a better outcome? So as a government, we've made a cross-government, all-government commitment to, to, keep the, to keep the promise. Um, and this is about our work to keep families together and to prevent unnecessary separation uh, of children uh, from, from, from the parents and how that is in everybody's interest. Um, it also speaks to the uh, additional stigma that women and mothers uh, experience if they are mothers who have a, a problem um, with substances. Um, and the, the fear that many women have in coming forward and seeking help. I know we'll be you know, debating and discussing stigma much uh, later today um, in, in, in Chamber. And therefore, um, as well as early intervention, there are cultural changes that are needed to ensure that women feel safe in coming forward um, and that they can build uh, trusted relationships. Thank you. Thanks very much, Julian. Okay, I'll bring in Miles Briggs. Convener, good morning, Minister and your officials. Um, there's a gap in, I think, what we're looking at, and I think that's to do with housing and homelessness. And it's something I know I've raised with the Minister a few times now, but it still is not being addressed. And government, quite frankly, are also not talking about the housing crisis, which we have. So I wanted to ask the Minister, given the statistics this week of the 222 people who died who were homeless, so half of these people um, died because of drug deaths. Now, what's the government going to do about this? Because we need to see action, and clearly we need to see supported housing models put in place. Um, so can I ask, what are the government doing on this? Because it seems to be an area, again, that ministers have taken their eye off the ball on. So it's not... It's most certainly not forgotten because, again, all the, the evidence and all that uh, lived experience uh, evidence uh, tells us that, you know, if, if we were to distill all of this down, what people need as a home, um, relationships and to feel valued and to have a purpose in life, um, whether that is through supporting people and you know, volunteering opportunities or, or employment. So people's accommodation needs are absolutely fundamental um, and, and basic. Um, what uh, we have seen with the um, homelessness death statistics, and again, you know, I, I hope not to be in any way deep personalise uh, the loss of life in the talk of um, statistics, but, but this information is, is crucial. And uh, Mr Briggs is absolutely 
correct to say that homeless deaths are too high, and he is absolutely correct uh, to say that more than half of these deaths are also uh, drug-related deaths. There's a very close association uh, with homelessness and, and, and drug-related deaths. What we have seen, and again, I say this by way of information, it's, and I'm most certainly I'm not one for overreading uh, one set of statistics, um, but the um, uh, the drug-related death aspect um, and th those set of figures um, reduced uh, from 151 to 127. So within the homelessness death, there's been a reduction in the numbers of people who uh, had a, a, a drug-related um, fatality. Now, they're still too high, but it does point to some movement. Um, I am a big proponent uh, of the Housing First approach. Um, Mr Briggs will be well aware of the, the government's um, ambitious record, actually, um, in terms of uh, building so social housing. Um, but it can't be housing without support, um, and that's why um, Ms Robeson and uh, her team you know, are taking forward uh, the Housing First approach and other um, approaches to you know, providing care for people as well as their um, accommodation. Thank you for that. And obviously, I shadow Ms. Robson. And part of the problem is sometimes the housing first model. Let's be honest about that, because often people who have chaotic lives are not able to hold down a tenancy. But that's setting people up to fail. Now, I've also discussed why we don't fund more supported accommodation and get that built and get that actually in place, because we should have been doing this years ago. Now, there's a charity, Rare and Alba, here in Edinburgh, who I hope the Minister will come and visit with me at some point, if she's not already seen them. Now, they provide accommodation for individuals with alcohol brain damage. That is supported living, which stops them being homeless. Now, there's a waiting list here in Edinburgh for another 50 people who could be in these sorts of accommodations. Nothing's happening to take that forward. Here in the city as well, there's 1,095 children living in temporary accommodation. I know from my casework that the substance misuse issues, which they are developing, is very acute. So that's where, Minister, I think we really need to see a shift. And, you know, Housing First is a good policy, but it's not delivering for this group of people. And we need to see a rethink, I think, on that. So um, I, I'll say something that is... Uh you know, ho hopefully positive, um, but also perhaps a bit defensive. Uh, so I think the Housing First model is good um, in that it is uh, meant to have enough flexibility to meet the needs of individuals in recognition that because of the, um, the, the chaos and the, the, the trauma that some people are living with, sustaining their own tenancy on their own um, is, is, you know, is unrealistic for them um, at, at that point in time. So I do think we shouldn't step back from the housing first model. I do think there is a point about other models of care um, and this is something you know, that I recognise within the uh, drug uh, uh, treatment uh, aspect of this. Um, we have very strong clear commitments around residential rehabilitation um, and that abstinence-based recovery model, We're not stepping away from that, but there are um, uh, there is a need for other uh, models of care. I think supported accommodation um, is clearly um, part of that, and that links in not just with the work on homelessness, but actually, as you said, the work um, in and around um, mental health. There is also, you know, there will be an opportunity um, for Parliament, uh, particularly when the homelessness prevention duties are, are refreshed. And again, I think there is something very powerful and cultural about the ask and act. Um, and there are too many people in inappropriate temporary accommodation. Um, I certainly, as a, a constituency MSP, uh, don't represent a, a, a city, but um, I uh, certainly um, have encountered young people being put in inappropriate accommodation, and that's not keeping the promise or doing their best by uh, every, every child. Um, but I do appreciate that, that there are some particular challenges in and around cities and um, part of our thinking in and around the cross-government uh, action plan that we'll bring forward is, you know, what specifically uh, we'll be able to do more to both scrutinise and support cities, bearing in mind that Glasgow, Edinburgh um, and Aberdeen all had uh, rising uh, drug deaths. Um, and we, again, we know that from the, from the annual report. And 
got time for one short I'll, question. I'll, I'll maybe come back to you sure. um, if, if, if that's okay. We've still got a number of members uh, to bring in, so I would appreciate uh, as succinct questions and answers as possible. And I'm going to move on to Russell Finlay to ask some questions around funding. Yeah, good morning. Um, I've got a lot to ask, but of course everyone else does, so I'll stick to probably what I think is the most important issue just now in front of me, which is the new report published yesterday by Favour UK. Um, it, I'm sure you're aware of its contents, is quite critical of the Scottish Government. It talks about a phenomenon it identifies as pretend rehab services. What it means by that is that beds categorised as being for the purpose of rehab aren't really for rehab, they're for stabilisation as helpful and as important as that is. But do you accept that criticism? And how would you respond to that criticism from them? Well, how, how I would respond is um, the government uh, and the residential rehabilitation um, development working group is very clear. Uh, and in Scotland, we have a very clear definition of what residential rehabilitation is. Uh, and what is not. Residential rehabilitation is um, you know, structured residential therapeutic programmes that are supporting people towards an uh, alcohol and drug-free lifestyle. There are other models of residential services, whether that's in and around crisis care or stabilisation. They are um, important also in terms of ensuring we have that wide spectrum of treatment opportunities and services in terms of getting the right people into the right treatment at um, the right time. Um, so I, I would dispute the claim that we are investing in pretendy uh, residential rehabilitation. I think, I think that's um, um, unfair, personally. Um, and um, what we are counting, if I can put it that way, um, and what we are funding um, is uh, that traditional uh, residential rehabilitation model that has historically been undervalued and underinvested um, in. I just think it's worth noting they didn't use the word pretend, they used the word pretend. Um, talking of counting of rehab beds, I've seen an email which was just from this month, in fact, from one of uh, your officials, a senior policy officer in the Scottish Government's residential rehab team. And this official says there was an error in a Scottish Government report about rehab beds. After publication, it became clear that wrong information, about 40 rehab beds had been published. Um, these, in fact, were stabilisation, not rehab beds. Um, and what it meant was this document uh, wrongly said there were 218 rehab beds when in fact there were 170, so it was a fall. So I suppose the question is how could something like this happen in an official government report? Um, and does this not perhaps speak to Favour's concerns that there is a blurring of the lines as, as evidenced by this mistake between rehab beds and stabilisation beds? So, um, firstly, Mr Finlay, that was not a government report, it was a Public Health Scotland um, report. And you're quite right to, to say um, that an error uh, was established in the information that Public Health Scotland had received um, from Glasgow. Um, and therefore, the quarterly figures um, had to be revised down. And they were um, revised down and there was transparency um, in and around that. Um, in terms of the quarterly figures that you're referring to, um, 170 residential rehab placements, the highest ever for any quarter, um, have been funded, uh, funded due to government uh, funding. And part of the reason that we are publishing information is so that uh, we can scrutinise what is happening uh, in every uh, local area. And I know um, for um, a fact that we have, uh, in the last financial year, um, supported the funding of over 500 residential rehabilitation um, placements and over the lifetime of the national mission, we have uh, supported 
uh, the funding uh, of over 700 uh, residential uh, rehabilitation services. I do accept that it's important to distinguish between uh, residential rehabilitation uh, and stabilisation services. Thank you. And, and, and talking of transparency, the Auditor General's report of March says there's a lack of transparency as to where the spending is taking place. I met with him last month and he says it's much the same still. So the £250 million, pounds, why is there no transparency around that? Well, at the start of this week, I published, in part uh, due to the recommendations from the Auditor General, um, an annual report that is detailing uh, the spend and the location um, of the national mission monies. Uh, I mean, I am determined to get as much transparency uh, as possible on this, uh, Mr Finlay. Um, I am determined um, to follow the money because I want to ensure, and I think this is where I'm on the same page as the Auditor General, I want to ensure that the additional resource that the National Mission has secured, that it has maximum effect, and that if, for example, uh, and this government has taken the decision uh, to allocate specific resources uh, to residential rehabilitation, I want to ensure that it's used uh, for pathways into residential rehabilitation, the residential rehabilitation beds, and of course associated aftercare. You know, so I want to satisfy myself, because I am accountable to Parliament, uh, that money is being spent on what it was destined for. That's great. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to um, bring in Gillian Mackay now just to pick up some questions in and around safe consumption rooms and then I'll bring Paul O'Kane back in. Gillian. Thanks, convener, and good morning, Minister. Um, the Minister will know my interest in the progress of safe consumption rooms, so could the Minister give an update on the work in this area? So, as Ms Mackay will know, that um, I am firmly in support of safe drug consumption facilities. I had the opportunity to visit a facility in East Harlem in New York, and can I just add that I was in the States on my own time, uh, at my own cost, um, before there are any questions in that um, regard. Um, and, and the evidence shows that safe drug consumption facilities uh, work, they save lives, they are not the silver bullet but they have a role to play and we have worked very hard um, with our partners in terms of Glasgow Health and Social Care Partnership, um, the Crown Office and Police Scotland and others to develop a proposition, a service specification um, and that um, has been submitted to, to the Crown Office. In terms of a more specific update, the Crown Office um, have been uh, gathering some further information, as I understand, uh, from Police Scotland and are nearing a position where they um, can give advice to, to the Lord Advocate. You will appreciate that I can't speak um, on behalf of the Crown Office or our independent Lord Advocate. Thanks for that, Minister. Um, we have a debate on stigma this afternoon and what, not wanting to preempt anything there. Could I ask the Minister what work is being done in communities where safe consumption rooms could be placed to ensure that the stigma around this service is reduced, that people know the potential public health benefits and that communities understand the purpose of the safe, con of the safe consumption rooms? So, actually, I think in terms of tackling stigma and understanding of um, drug and alcohol issues as, as a public health issue and attitudes towards various treatments, I think there is um, um, a role there because, you know, sometimes people have, you know, um, communities can have views about the location of any service uh, within their um, community. Um, and therefore, it's important that, uh, you know, local services are engaging um, and having a very open dialogue um, with, 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 with local communities. Thanks, Camina. Um, I'll move straight across to Paul O'Kane and then I'll bring in Alex Cole Hamilton. Thank you very much, Convener. Um, in previous discussions around safe consumption facilities, uh, we've discussed the legal barriers that exist, and I, I think the Minister would contend that that's a significant challenge in terms of being able to deliver them. But I, I suppose I'm interested to understand what analysis have officials done of 
uh, current legislation that exists that might help to overcome that. So, for example, has the National Health Service Scotland Act been looked at in terms of the provisions within that, which uh, allow um, you know, or puts a duty uh, on <coughs> government to promote in Scotland comprehensive and integrated health service to secure improvement in the physical and mental health of people, uh, prevention, diagnosis and treatment of illness sitting within that act. So I wonder to what extent have officials looked at other legislation that might help us to, to move forward? So I think there's two, two broad points I would wish, wish to make. So um, we are still waiting on the Lord Advocate giving us a view whether the service specification and operational procedures whether they are within our powers and whether that rests within her powers to determine prosecution policy and what is in the public interest. So that is a, a core consideration to this. There are, of course, Mr Keynes' right to point to other health-related legislation. The other bit of legislation we can't ignore is the Misuse of Drugs Act. Um, so, you know, we have... Uh, again, worked hard with partners to, um, we, we hope, we think, you know, devise um, a, a proposition that is uh, within what we can currently do in Scotland. But I am not, I'm not the final arbitrator of that, and hence, you know, the role of the, the, the Lord Advocate. I think you, you also allude to a point that, that Ms Mackay made, that there are other models here, there are other ways to implement safer drug consumption facilities um, in, in that you know there are you know some very um, um, you know there's the, the fixed model fixed premise you know there are very kind of uh, clinically medically led models there are other models that you know where they are more voluntary sector led um, and of course there are mobile mobile uh, models of safe drug consumption facilities um, as well. And while ideally I would rather have been starting from the position of which model will best meet the needs um, of our people, where we are right now, because of the, the, the Misuse of Drugs Act, we, we are framing a service in relation to our powers. And that is, is being detailed, it's difficult, it requires very precise work. But it's not, it's not the ideal way to do this. There are other models there, so we are framing our proposition around what we hope is within our powers, but I'm, I'm not the final arbiter of that, as you would appreciate. Okay. I wonder if I might very, very briefly, very just, just, I, I think that, that, that's helpful in terms of what's been looked at in terms of context, and, but I just wonder would the Minister be willing to share um, what information she has gathered on, for example, that specific act that I referenced for the yeah, committee's we'll have, information? We'll have, we'll have a look at that, yeah, that's Thank not you. a problem, of course. Um, I'm going to bring in Sue Weber. You've got a follow-up, I think, to Paul, and then I'll bring in uh, Alex Cole-Hamilton. Yes, thank you, conveners. So specifically, Minister, in following on from uh, Ms Paul O'Kane, what correspondence have you had from Police Scotland, uh, the Crown Office and other justice authorities regarding the proposal for the safe consumption rooms and can you make those public as well? Um, so the proposition, of course, could change depending on the feedback that we get from um, the Lord Advocate and, and the Crown Office in, in, in due course. Um, our work has um, centred around you know, one service in one city, um, but there's been a, a broad range of, of, of work. Um, the correspondence in the work isn't all mine's. Um, you will appreciate that the kind of central, uh, there's a very central role here for uh, Independent Police Scotland and um, the Integrated um, Joint Board. Um, my approach um, within government is has been to, you know, facilitate that um, and to support that um, and to, you know, enable people to, I suppose, build from the ground up, you know, a proposition that is, you know, framed within the, the, the powers that we have. But we'll have a look at what I will look at what, what would be appropriate for me to share. Because I appreciate uh, the great interest in this. And I also um, appreciate that um, 
I th there is strong parliamentary support for safe drug consumption facilities. And while, while I know some um, Conservative members have reservations, um, I also take them at their word, words that they're not looking to stand, stand, in, in the, in, 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 stand in the way of a pilot. Indeed. Thank you. I'll bring in Alex Cole, uh, thank you very much for bringing me back in, convener. Um, and the minister knows my party's uh, long-held support for safe consumption rooms, and it speaks to the approach that we discussed in our earlier exchange about um, that understanding that people will always consume, uh, that zero tolerance um, doesn't work, um, and we need to help them to consume as safely as possible if that's if that's their choice. Um, this now rests with the Lord Advocate, and we know from yesterday's events the Lord Advocate's been very busy. Can I ask, is the is the Lord Advocate actually working? to a timeline on this. Do you have an expectation of when she'll come back to you with it? Because actually, with every week that goes by, it's potentially lives that aren't saved. I um, appreciate that point, Mr Cole Hamilton, that um, time, time is of the essence. Um, and um, again, you will appreciate that um, I won't help matters by stepping into other people's duties and terrain. Um, but you're point is well made that time, time is of the essence. These services work. They're not the only solution, but they work. And I have seen them for myself. And the core issue of the national mission is to get people into the treatment that's right for them. And while I am, I hope, um, have conveyed my conviction in and around abstinence-based intervention and uh, the traditional residential rehabilitation. We also need to be fearless, absolutely fearless, um, about harm reduction because lives depend on it. And I know there are some aspects of harm reduction will feel counterintuitive to many people, but we have to do what works, follow the evidence, and do what we can to reach people where they are, uh, to build relationships and to begin that journey to connect them with other services. And safer drug consumptions are part of that. It's part of us saying we care and we want people to live and survive and thrive. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I'm now going to come back and bring in Sue Weber just to pick up some questions around early intervention uh, and then we'll move on. Thank you, Sue. Can I just check with the convener? Do I also have a question that I can ask around no wrong door as well? Is that yeah? That's fine. Just want to check. So thank you very much, um, um, convener, minister. The task force has recommended that the Scottish government prioritise intervention at an earlier stage, tackling the root cause of drug dependency that, and that links between work on poverty, structural inequality, education, children and young people and work on drug policy should be clearer. I think these are things we hear across all committee portfolios about early intervention. Um, so can the Minister outline what early intervention should look, look like in this policy area and what steps will she be taking to ensure a more joined up approach to tackling all of the root causes of drug dependency? And I know Mr Briggs has mentioned earlier around housing as well. So, I mean, the, purpose, the reason we have a national mission is to join the dots so that uh, drug policy doesn't sit uh, in, in isolation. In terms of, you know, more specifically, um, and Ms Weber asked a fair question about what does, you know, early, you know, intervention, you know, look like in terms of drugs policy, um, you know, our work with families, um, the work with communities, you know, the work with housing and homelessness, um, and how all of that needs to be absolutely aligned. And, of course, the purpose of the cross government Government um, action plan is to ensure that the, all of these actions, you know, there's a breadth of action, there's huge investment despite these trying times across government. How do we make all of that align better and work better together um, for you know, better um, outcomes? Um, in terms of our uh, support to alcohol and drug partnerships, it is um, very clear that we need alcohol and drug partnerships. Um, not to be in um, isolation, um, that they need to be very much uh, connected and the work that they do needs to be central to children's services plans, it needs to be central to that broader um, community planning. Um, uh, all public authorities have a, a Fairer Scotland uh, duty put on them, I know this, I um, introduced that 
a number of years back, Mr Cole Hamilton might remember. Um, and you know, that is about that every strategic decision needs to you know, be thinking about how, how do the decisions we make here and now have an impact on uh, child poverty and reducing you know, poverty and, and, and inequality. And I think you know, our work with ADPs is driven by the fact that quite often the work that they have been done has been separate from other work done by IGBs, you know, community plan and partnerships, and it's got to be front and centre. It's got to be front and centre. Thank you, Minister, for that, and uh, thank you, Convener. We also, I'm glad to hear about the joining the dots, and that's the intention and the ambition of what we're doing. And I know in the, we have had a discussion around a, a constituency case where the individual found it very challenging. Uh, having first tried to access services in February but not gaining a space in rehabilitation until September. And I think what we hear again and again is that these people looking and seeking services are treated like a pinball in a pinball machine. They're pinged about and they're, they're following the route that the service wants them to follow. It's not centred around them. And we hear about person-centred care often, but I don't get a sense that this service is really delivering for those in that way. So in terms of that no wrong door approach, I think we're not getting a sense that what's happening on the ground is what is being said and stated in documents and by ministers and by civil servants. So what can we do to address that implementation gap to make sure that there is no wrong door for these people to go to and that they get the help quickly and not having to wait six or seven months before they can access this help? So there's, there's a number of layers of that to, to, to that convener. Um, so, and if I can go back to a, a point that I made, made earlier, the reason we are publishing lots of local information about what's happening with additional investment is so that can be scrutinised and where there are issues, um, it can be addressed. Um, the member will be aware from, from our previous discussions, but so I won't re rehearse um, that every uh, area now has a pathway into uh, residential rehabilitation. But I also know, I mean, what I hear most um, from my engagement with people from the front, on the front line and people with real life experience is that fragmentation of services. And that's why we have a national mission. That's why we have a task force uh, that has made some very strong and challenging recommendations, not just about no wrong door, that, you know, that there's to be no, no closed doors to people. And it's the, the, I think it's the biggest frustration that people have about being bounced around uh, between services. And I think the things that will help uh, will be the Ask and Act homelessness prevention duties. This isn't just about, you know, you know, people being passed, you know, from pillar to post that, you know, that in key posts in the public sector you have, you know, duties to ask and then act. I also think the work around um, mental health and substance use services is, is, is critical here and, you know, the a response to the task force will also align with a response to Mental Welfare Commission. Um, recent reports, two reports this year, and also the rapid review into mental health and substance use services. And some of that um, is about services on the ground being really, really clear that you cannot deny somebody a service on treatment until they are, you know, for example, abstinence from, from, from drug or alcohol. And there needs to be much clearer understanding on the ground um, about, you know, um, who, who the lead service should be, whether it's mental health or substance use, and then when, when the other partners um, are, are, are brought in. And we will be coming back to Parliament on that. I just wanted to ask about accountability on that. So, yeah. it's, you know, where does it lie? If, if well, I mean, can, of course, I can ask for a succinct answer. Okay. We've still got um, I a that. number of areas of questions. About 15 minutes left. Thank you. Okay. Well, I think what I will, will say about accountability is that it's accountability at each and every level. Um, I am stepping up accountability for local areas, but I stress I'm not asking other people to do anything that I'm not prepared um, to do myself. But accountability um, and leadership 
um, at a very local level, uh, but also within uh, senior levels within IGBs and uh, local authorities and government is, is crucial. But it's accountability at each and every level. We are accountable to ourselves and to each other, and we need to challenge ourselves and each other. Thank you for that, Convener. Thanks very much indeed. Um, we'll now move on to some questions around the National Stigma Action Plan. I'm going to bring in Voice Old Chowdhury and then I'll bring in Gillian Martin. Thank you very much, Convener. Uh, good morning, uh, Minister. Uh, my question is on uh, people from uh, minority ethnic background are often hit harder by cultural or community stigma and may find it harder to seek help when they need it. Uh, they need to. So what can be done to address this? So, uh, again, it's a very important point, and it's uh, convener reflected in our national mission plan. Um, you will see that in terms of our um, outcomes framework uh, and the importance of not just tackling poverty and inequality, uh, but really focusing down on equalities and, and different groups. I've spoken today already about women uh, and about young people. Um, my... my uh, concern is that we are not doing enough to reach into other communities. Um, I am conscious that sometimes services can have uh, stereotypes or misconceptions about other um, communities. And if I can assure Mr Chaudhry um, that myself and my officials that we have uh, you know, begun to make better contacts um, with, with groups. Um, and some of this is about the visibility of the recovery community as well, and that has encouraged other groups. I recently made contact um, with a lady from a, a Scottish women's uh, Muslim group, um, for, for example. So I am conscious that um, while across our society in general, drug and alcohol problems can be hidden, um, I think they can be even more hidden uh, within some communities, and some of that can be related to our uh, false perceptions um, of other communities. And we really do need to be thinking um, more sharply, I think it's fair to say, about how we reach out to other communities. So if uh, uh, members, or, or indeed Mr Chaudhry, you know, wish to engage further than that, I would be, be delighted to do so. Thanks very much. Mr Chowdhury, would you like to come back in? No, uh, thank you very much. Uh, thanks for the answer, Minister, and I'll be very happy to get involved in future. Okay, that, that, thanks very much indeed. So I'm going to bring in Julian Martin, and then I'll come across to Natalie Dawn. Julian. Thank you very much, Convener. I only have one question. It's around stigma um, of medically assisted treatments. And uh, I'm just wondering, the Minister, even in, in the, the last, I, I suppose, her tenure, there's been a lot more, I think, more nuanced conversation about the, the way that medically assisted treatments um, are a, a pathway for a lot of people that's going to, to prevent them from, from getting into crisis and, 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 and prevent drug-related deaths. Um, would, would the Minister like to, to outline how, um, I suppose, any stigma around medically assisted treatment might actually cause massive harm to people um, and, and, and around the discourse that we have, both in politics and in the media, around um, you know, people who have to, have to have access to, say, methadone, whatever, it could, it could actually cause more harm? I think it is fair to say that uh, stigma in some quarters um, exists about certain types of treatment and some of the uh, discourse um, that you read or, or hear about in and around you know, methadone, for example, is uh, un unhelpful. Um, and I, um, time and time again, say, you know, I am not interested in supporting um, harm reduction or medicated assisted treatment at the expense of residential rehab and abstinence. Neither am I interested in supporting abstinence um, over, you know, harm re reduction. That the only thing I am interested in is supporting people. And we 
you know, people need to have informed choices and options. There is a big international evidence base around, you know, different strands of medicated assisted uh, treatment, um, but medication should never be our only offer to people, hence the importance um, of implementing MAT standards that is essentially about um, treating drug and alcohol issues um, on a par with other health conditions. If any of us sitting around here trip up to our doctor on any uh, other health condition, you know, we're given information, we're given choices, we have a bit of a discussion um, about what's best. And it's that ethos um, that we need. People should always have choices and options and the space to engage and to make informed choices about what's best. For them. I'm not interested in false arguments around you know, harm reduction versus um, uh, abstinence. Um, and you know, we've just we've got to kind of dump our own ideological perspectives. I mean, my own view on many things have changed over the years, and we need to follow the evidence, but crucially we need to be listening to uh, what um, each individual wants and needs. Indeed. Okay, I'm going to move swiftly on. We've got about seven, eight minutes left to um, some questions around public health approaches in the justice system. And I'll bring in Natalie Dawn and then Katie Clark. Thanks, convener. I know the task force's final report states that they found, I, I believe the quote is, tentative support for decriminalisation or regulation of the market. Now, this has been shown to reduce drug deaths in some other countries. It would allow resources to be better focused. And finally, it could work to reduce stigma around the general population. So can I ask the Minister if this is something that the government would pursue if it was possible and advise of any discussions that have taken place with counterparts at Westminster in relation to this? And equally, the more punitive approach that the UK government have recently suggested that they will be following, which could work against the public health approach that we're taking here in Scotland. Gosh, right. Um, <laughs> how, how to answer that succinctly? Seven. Um, so I'm going to do my best, convener. Um, so, um, first thing I want to say, uh, my focus in this job has always been first and foremost on what I can do, uh, and therefore, you know, my endeavours um, are, are, are focused on the powers and resources at, at my disposal. You know, ultimately, I'm a pragmatist at heart, um, and I want to crack on and do things now. I do not, however, ignore the implications of powers elsewhere. I am not looking to enter into any kind of constitutional debates um, here and now, but of course the, the Misuse of Drugs Act um, has uh, an implication uh, in what we can and can't do. Um, it um, impairs, um, in my view, you know, some of our approaches to, to harm reduction or certainly makes that journey towards improving harm reduction uh, interventions um, harder. The issue of decriminalisation um, or drug law reform is complex um, and uh, I think you know, there is um, a debate, about, I suppose I would frame it about drug law reform um, more, more generally. Um, Decriminalisation means different things in different countries. Um, but in terms of going back to principles and basics, uh, what's going to work? What's going to make folk safer, if not safe? Um, we can't, I'm very clear, we can't punish people out of addiction. Um, and the international um, evidence that we've looked at, and we published a paper actually mm, last March, last May, that was looking at international uh, responses to drug law reform in very broad terms, um, I'm summarising convener, um, showed that the public health approach was more effective at uh, reducing harm. And that actually, you know, some of people's fears around drug law reform um, more, more broadly um, that you know, people, people often worry about you know, increasing drug use, but the evidence doesn't appear um, to show that. Um, but we, we do need to, uh, in my view, you know, have a review um, of drug law, um, I, I would argue, across the UK. Um, UK um, government, I think it's fair to say, are, are not inclined to do that. Um, I will be meeting the new minister um, at the beginning of December. It's a, a, a frequent um, dis discussion point. Okay. 
Thank you very much. Okay, finally, I'll come to Katie Clark, and then we'll bring the session to a close. Katie. Picking up on that point about the dialogue that you're having with Westminster, it's quite clear there's very much a different approach from the UK government in terms of these issues, a far more punitive approach to the public health approach that's being discussed here today. Um, so what scope do you think there is um, to genuinely be able to do some different things in Scotland on the basis of the discussions that you've had so far. I appreciate it's been a changing scene down there. It may be a different person that you'll be meeting in December than before. But what, what are, you know, where are you in terms of those discussions, in terms of you know, um, being able to have divergence in Scotland and go ahead, for example, with you know, some of the things that are within our competence round about consumption rooms, but looking at other initiatives as well. Uh, how do you feel you're getting on with that, and are you able to really, you know, focus on specific proposals in your discussions? So, um, despite um, I suppose differences of opinions in terms of um, Kit Malthouse, who was the first UK government minister I met in relation to this uh, job, um, we had, you know, some, some well, well documented differences, but, but nonetheless, actually, we had a lot of engagement. Um, the quick succession of ministers in recent times. Uh, that has coincided with uh, recent changes of Prime Minister it means that there are uh, two, two ministers that were in office um, for such a short period of time that while I, I, I wrote to them welcoming them to the role and with all of the issues that I wish to discuss with them, it, time did not uh, permit actually meeting them. Um, I think to, you know, in, in terms of where that there is some agreement around, you know, issues on things like leadership, invest in reform and services, uh, the, the, the importance of of treatment. Um, we have some agreement in and around the need to um, legislate for the regulation of pill presses. That's very important in terms of tackling um, the illicit market in, in benzodiazepines. Um, we will see where we get to with home office applications in and around drug checking. We are on a completely different place in terms of safe drug consumption facilities, but I will see uh, where the new minister is. Uh, that's um, a gentleman called Chris Phillips. Um, and what's most uppermost in my mind just now is the UK government's white paper on um, swift, tough consequences. Uh, and I think that is misguided. Uh, I think it will potentially cause more harm. I think it's based on um, an outmoded, um, punitive approach. And I continue to seek urgent clarity of if and how this would apply to Scotland. The uh, Home Office um, white paper said that Tier 1 and Tier 3 could potentially may um, apply to Scotland and Northern Ireland and I would have uh, grievous concerns about that and I'm conscious that I have also written to committee uh, about that too. Okay. Thank you very much indeed. I'm going to have to, time is against us, I'm going to have to bring uh, our meeting to a close. Uh, I know members will have some outstanding questions uh, and we will write to the Minister uh, with some follow-up points uh, if members would like. Uh, so, a big thank you, Minister. Um, that's been a really uh, interesting and helpful session, and uh, to your officials as well this morning. Um, and I'll now bring the public part of our meeting to a close, uh, and we'll move into private session. And we'll just pause briefly to allow our witnesses to leave. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you. To uh, colleagues. Uh, all the time, and um, I'm sure uh, people will be shy in seeking more information or more dialogue where appropriate. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you.